Hello, my name is Jessica McLean, and I will be doing a presentation on the plan of care for Huntington's disease patients ages 18 to 65. This presentation is meant for nurses within a hospital. Huntington's disease is a progressive, incurable, genetic, neurodegenerative disorder. It affects approximately 4 to 10 people per 100,000. The average age of onset is 35 to 44 years old, and survival time is usually 15 to 18 years after first symptoms. HD affects the person's ability to walk, speak, and reason. Symptoms include personality changes, depression, mood swings, impaired judgments and forgetfulness, slurred speech, weight loss, difficulty swallowing, unsteady gait, and involuntary movements called chorea. Eventually, the individual passes away due to pneumonia, heart disease, and other complications. First, we will go over the effects of aging and Huntington's disease on each body system. Huntington's disease is not fatal by itself, but life-threatening complications occur related to the disease. Among the leading causes of death for people with HD is heart disease. According to the CDC, heart disease is the leading cause of death for the general population as well. Cardiac output decreases linearly after the third decade at a rate of about 1% per year in normal subjects, otherwise free of cardiac disease. The largest risk factor for heart disease is inactivity. And people with Huntington's disease become bedridden and inactive, which puts them at a greater risk for developing heart disease. In the age range of 18 to 65, there are not many changes to the hematopoietic system. This is the system of organs and tissues, primarily the bone marrow, spleen, tonsils, and lymph nodes that are involved in the production of blood. Huntington's disease is associated with the expansion of the protein Huntington. Huntington expression is required for the generation and expansion of hematopoietic cells and provides an alternative system in which to assess the function of Huntington. People with HD produce an abnormally long version of this protein. This abnormal protein disrupts the normal function of neurons, causing neurodegeneration. More research is needed about the normal function of Huntington to fully understand the changes in the Huntington's patient. The incidence of pneumonia increases with age due to a general decrease in the immune system. Aspiration also plays a major role in the increase of pneumonia with age. Pneumonia is the leading cause of death in Huntington's disease, followed by heart disease. Although the exact percentage is unknown, most HD patients have dysphagia, especially in the advanced stage of the disease. Therefore, aspiration is the most likely cause of the fatal pneumonia. Urinary incontinence increases with age, usually due to stress incontinence. Urinary incontinence in Huntington's disease may be due to involuntary movement of the muscles in the bladder. Immobility plays a role in the incontinence of the HD patient as well. Individuals with HD experience malnutrition and weight loss. Both of these can cause an electrolyte imbalance and impaired kidney function. Each gender has their own reproductive changes related to age. Menopause occurs in women due to the disappearance of oocytes. Enlargement of the prostate occurs in most older men. There are no reproductive changes with individuals diagnosed with Huntington's disease. The only consideration is that individuals with HD may decide to not have children due to the positive genetic testing. As we age, there is a progressive deterioration in the number and function of insulin-producing beta cells. The cell's ability to recognize and respond to changes in glucose is impaired. Besides the normal aging changes to the endocrine system, there are no changes to the individual with Huntington's disease. As we age, there are alterations in gastric motility, gastrointestinal hormone release, taste and smell, and intestinal overgrowth. The alterations in swelling, called dysphagia, can cause silent aspiration. These changes in gastrointestinal function can also lead to fecal incontinence and constipation. Individuals with Huntington's disease usually end up having to have a gastrointestinal tube placed due to their decreased cognition and risk for aspiration. Individuals with Huntington's suffer from fecal incontinence due to immobility and decreased cognition. Constipation is also a problem for these individuals since they are immobile. 
Lean body mass decreases with age, primarily due to the atrophy of muscle cells. Bone density decreases and the bones become more fragile, especially after menopause for women. The joints in the body break down leading to inflammation, stiffness, and pain. This breakdown may lead to arthritis in some individuals. In addition, movement and gait slows with aging. Individuals with Huntington's disease also typically have muscle problems such as rigidity or muscle contracture called dystonia, as well as impaired gait, posture, and balance. The eventual, eventual inability to walk will cause muscle atrophy and weight loss. With Huntington's disease, there is a premature death of cells within the stratum of the basal ganglia. This is the region of the brain that controls movement. Cells also die within the cortex, which is the section of the brain associated with memory, judgment, thinking, and perception. Cells also die within the cerebellum, which coordinates voluntary muscle activity. Researchers now believe that a building block for protein called glut glutamine abnormally collects in the cell nucleus, causing death. It is still unknown why this protein only kills certain brain cells. There are no changes to the integumentary system with Huntington's disease. Consideration should be given to the risk for skin breakdown, though. These patients become bedridden and inactive in the late stages of the disease, which put them at an increased risk for pressure ulcers. Now we will discuss the risk factors for Huntington's disease. There are two types of risk factors, modifiable and non-modifiable. Non-modifiable risk factors are characteristics that you cannot change that put you at a higher risk for developing a disease. These risk factors include age, gender, family history, and ethnic and racial background. Modifiable risk factors are characteristics that you can take measures to change that put you at a higher risk for developing a disease. There are two classes of modifiable risk factors, behavioral and biomedical. Behavioral risk factors include tobacco smoking, excess, alcohol use, physical activity, poor diet, and others. Biomedical risk factors include excess weight, high blood pressure, high blood cholesterol, and others. The non-modifiable risk factors for Huntington's disease include family history, age, gender, and ethnic and racial background. Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder, so family history is the greatest risk factor. If one parent has HD, their offspring has a 50% chance of inheriting the disease. If the child never develops the disease, then they will not pass it on to their children. In other words, it does not skip generations. If the gene for HD is present, you will develop the disease at some point. The usual age of onset is 35 to 44 years old, so your risk of having symptoms of the disease is greater during this time period. If symptoms have not occurred during this age range, your chances of developing the disease are lower. HD affects both males and females equally. It is also known that HD affects all ethnic and racial backgrounds. However, the prevalence of HD is between 3 and 7 per 100,000 in populations of Western European descent. Since Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder, it does not have any modifiable risk factors. How to deal with the disease. Patients should be educated on how to deal with the diagnosis of Huntington's disease. This should include telling them about support groups that are available for the patient and their caregivers. You should educate the patient and family on how to devise a communication system before communication becomes too difficult. Also, educate the patient on the need to stay healthy by exercising, complying with medication regimens, healthy eating, and smoking cessation. Moving on to the primary, secondary, ter and tertiary rehabilitation services and nursing care interventions. Primary interventions are aimed at preventing a disease from occurring. Since Huntington's is a genetic disorder, there is no way to prevent the disease from occurring if you have a mutation. However, you can prevent other diseases from occurring, which will complicate Huntington's disease. So a healthy lifestyle should be encouraged. This can be accomplished by exercising, complying with medication regimens, healthy eating, and smoking cessation. Secondary interventions are aimed at detecting an, a disease early. Patients with a family history of Huntington's disease should be educated on the early signs of, and symptoms of the disease. Pre-symptomatic testing should be explained to the patient as well. This is a laboratory test that will test for the HD genetic marker. 
tertiary interventions are aimed at reducing the damage caused by the disease. These should include reducing fall risk, reducing the risk for skin breakdown, maintaining a balanced diet, reducing anxiety, finding other ways to communicate, reducing the risk for disturbed thought processes, and impaired social interaction. Now we will go over what you should do as a nurse caring for this type of patient. Fall and pressure ulcer prevention should be part of this patient's plan of care. You can pad the patient's side rails and head of bed, but you need to ensure that the patient will be able to see over the top of the bed to decrease anxiety. Use padded heel and elbow protectors. You need to keep the skin clean. Turn the patient every two hours. Apply skin lotions frequently. Encourage ambulation with assistance to maintain muscle tone and use bed and chair alarms to prevent falls. These patients take in less than their body requirements and are at risk for dehydration due to swallowing or chewing disorders and their risk for aspiration. So here are some ways to help with that problem. Talk to the patient before mealtime to reduce anxiety. Use mealtime for social interaction. Learn the position that is best for this patient. Keep the patient as close to upright as possible when eating. Show the patient the food and tell the patient what they are and whether they are hot or cold foods. Do not interrupt, turn, interpret turning away, stiffness, and sudden turning as rejection. These are involuntary movements. Give these patients snacks in between meals since their constant movement, movements are using more calories. Caregivers for these patients need to be taught the Heimlich maneuver in case of choking at home. Here are some ways to reduce anxiety and improve communication with these patients. You can read to the patient and teach them relaxation therapies to help reduce anxiety. Consult a speech therapist to help prolong and maintain communication abilities. Devise a communication system, perhaps using cards with words or pictures of familiar objects before communication becomes too difficult. Learn how this patient expresses needs using nonverbal communication. These patients can understand, even if they are unable to speak. These patients are locked in their bodies. They are there mentally until the very end, even if they cannot express themselves. Do not isolate these patients just because they cannot speak. Huntington's disease patients are at risk for disturbed thought processes and impaired social interactions. Um, having a clock and calendar within the patient's view can help reduce this. Interact with the patient. Use music for relaxation. Reorient the patient when they wake up. Educate the patient and family on the need to have a patient wear an identification bracelet with name, telephone number, and memory impaired on it. Recruit and train volunteers to interact with these patients. Do not abandon these patients just because the disease is terminal. These patients are living until the very end. There is no treatment that will reverse or halt the process of Huntington's disease. There are ways to reduce the symptoms though. Nevane and Haldol improve chorea symptoms in many patients. Some anti-Parkinson's medications, such as levodopa, have shown some benefits to help with rigidity, and, and antidepressant medications can be given to these patients. With the use of technology, patients and caregivers can communicate with physicians through portals instead of going into the office all the time. The use of bed alarms triggering a phone call to the patient's nurse will help to reduce falls in these patients. The plan of care of these patients could be triggered within the computer system, which would remind the nurse to perform certain tasks unique to these patients. 